Dark Messiah is a Source Engine action RPG. That makes this the second time I've done a video on something in that category. But where I felt like it was a mod of Half-Life 2, this is a game in its own right, with a decent level of polish to it. It was developed by Arcane Studios, who are probably better known today for doing the Dishonored series. Story-wise, the game takes place in the rebooted Might and Magic series. But don't let that put you off. This game is basically a standalone. I don't remember what happened in those other games, but I could follow this one easily. And that's because the game gives you all the context you need. Now, it doesn't start that way. It's a fairly standard chosen one doomsday prophecy that a lot of video games have. But to be fair, the cutscene is awesome. You have an armored warrior summoning a demon, or maybe a discontinued games workshop figure. A vague prophecy didn't get my attention. This did. Last daughter of a forlorn line shall guide him into history. The player's story begins right after this. You're a wizard's apprentice, and your master is sent you on an expedition to retrieve a crystal. And that's it. The opening area gives a good first impression for the visuals. It looks really good for a decade-old source game. There's a lot of great texture work and pretty sharp lighting. The word crisp describes it best. The environments are especially a step up from what you'd expect. Whether it's a dungeon, or a town, or anywhere else outdoors, there's something good to see. While some objects and character models do appear dated, it's nice that so much else has held up. I think the setting is more on the generic side of fantasy, but when the art style does have a unique flavor, I generally enjoy it. There's not a ton that stands out, and nothing to really rave about. It never looks bad. If it's fun and presented well, I don't really mind if a sci-fi or a fantasy game has a kind of bland art style. It just can't have something awful. Like this. We're not going to talk about that. So the presentation starts off on the right foot, but there's something a little bit off about it. It's the movement. It's not just the head bob either. When you turn, you turn your head first. It's a bit unusual to see your limbs kind of catching up with your head whenever you pivot around. It doesn't happen as dramatically when you're moving around, but it's something to get used to. I don't talk about these often, but the tutorial in Dark Messiah is something I really want to take a look at. It's a little odd. Sure, it goes through your standard how to play the game controls, but look at what it emphasizes. Slice through the rope. That should help. Think. Adapt. Kick that creature back and watch it fall. That's the first enemy in the game. It teaches you about using your weapon after that. The tutorial focuses on manipulating and navigating the environment. Even all the combat lessons tie into this. Kick him over the edge. Be efficient, Sam. There's no sword fighting lesson here. I didn't have a regular shield, but I did have the corpse of this guy's friend. That worked out okay. So I throw it at him, and now I have the upper hand. This is the key to Dark Messiah. Do not think like a fantasy hero. You're Brendan Fraser in The Mummy, or Kevin McAllister. Trick people. I might have gotten a little ahead of myself, so let me take it from the top. The real story kicks off when you return to your master. He wants you to take the crystal you found to a wizard in the city. He doesn't send you alone. He summons a spirit named Xana and implants her inside of your head to accompany you. As far as story progression goes, the game is very linear. No matter what, you'll go through all the levels in a certain sequence. The story itself is kind of hard to talk about without getting into spoilers, but I'll get into it a little bit for now. The main character is named Sareth, and he's remarkably bland. I'm not entirely sure why, but he reminds me of Keanu Reeves in the Dracula movie. An ancestor? I see a resemblance. I have a letter of introduction. Let me see it then. The overall plot of find an artifact before the bad man does isn't exactly new. I also think some elements are poorly paced, and this makes some reveals really underwhelming. There are some pretty unique elements here, but nothing I can touch on yet. So let's get into the gameplay. When you complete objectives, you earn skill points, and you have a lot of options. Your skills are divided up into three main categories of combat, magic, and miscellaneous. Each of these has sub-branches, and some skills have ranks to them. If you like using bows, this game might not be for you. Look at all these melee combat skills you can get. Pretty impressive. What about archery? I'm not really feeling this. To start off with, the magic in this game is really fun. It's hard to compare having an arrow to having a fireball. 
The game also has a lot of fighting in cramped hallways. It's not constant, but if you made a ranged build, you might be in trouble. I was playing the second hardest difficulty, which gives the enemies more health and damage, and a bow is terrible for that. Even on normal, enemies can close the gap fast, like this guy. Not a good time to have a bow. I don't recommend it. You could also try investing in a stealth tree. How sneaky you're being is indicated by the circle being filled up with white, but I don't really understand it. I didn't move any faster here and no one turned around, but now I'm spotted. You can still play as a fun stealth character. Just be aware that the system is a little bit glitchy. Some of the people who made the Thief games worked on Dark Messiah, but don't go in expecting Thief. When it comes to melee weapons, you have a pretty good variety. Swords, staffs, axes, hammers, it's all there. You start unlocking special attacks the more points you put in your melee tree. You can combine these with other attacks, like stunning an enemy and then disarming them. No matter what weapon you're using, the melee combat feels excellent. You can't easily spam clicks at enemies because they'll just parry you. You have to time power attacks to break through them. The enemies also have pretty high health and damage output, so fighting them feels meaningful. It can only take a few hits to kill you. Unfortunately, like the stealth, it's also kind of glitchy. Though I kind of wonder if it's just a poor implementation of their combat system. Power attacks are supposed to break parries and do damage, so like here. I hold my shield up to block his attack, but it does damage anyways. So did he just glitch through? Or is that working as intended, but there's no stumbling animation or something like that? I don't know, but either way, it looks like it's broken. So even though I love the melee combat, it's not reliable. At least when playing defensively. But remember the tutorial. Think. Adapt. You could have an honorable sword fight, but that's dangerous. The enemies are tough, and there's a better way. Compare this to this. That was easy. The environment is full of things you could use to your advantage. Dark Messiah is a giant bar fight across the realm. Viewing it any other way will get you killed pretty quickly. You can use melee to position your enemies into a trap. What was that? Stop right there. Don't try to run. Don't move, buddy. Oh. What makes the level interactivity so good is that the combat complements it rather than replacing it. Getting new weapons and spells just increases your options. Yeah, you could use the freeze spell normally and just stun an enemy, or you could do something more interesting with the environment. He almost made it. There we go. For example, the telekinesis spell entirely revolves around you using the environment. You can always throw normal objects, but what if your weight limit was increased and you could pick up things from farther away? So even if you never use the environment, the combat is fun on its own. You're just rewarded for thinking more creatively. Let's look at that fight I showed in the beginning. The enemies are also kicking barrels at me, but one isn't a very good shot. But if we go back a bit, you'll notice there's an oil jar in the ledge. That'll come in handy later. I'm only using Zibbity Zaps as the bad man chases me up the stairs, but then I throw a barrel down. I could have ignored it and just kept using magic, but it was something I could use to my advantage. When I start pushing the enemies back down the stairs, I'm using a combat staff. But it's also a bit of a flaming tiki torch. So I kick the orc to where the oil jar got broken in the fighting. There are also reinforcements coming up the stairs. And now this man is laying in the oil pile, so he'll make a nice barricade. If you use indirect methods or stick to nothing but direct combat, either way you build up an adrenaline meter. When that fills up, you can insta-kill with melee weapons. The effect also makes spells more powerful. With telekinesis, you can just grab people and toss them around. This is magic done right. Looking around for advantages isn't just limited to combat either. Health potions, mana potions, and food all need to be found. There's no store inventories or shops or anything like that. Same goes for new armor and weapons. If you're someone who likes finding secrets in games, this is for you. Dark Messiah is chock full of secret areas. I'm not even sure if someone's made a complete record of all of them. There's just so many. They're really good secrets too. You can find pretty powerful items in these areas. I might not like ranged builds, but an endless quiver of arrows is pretty useful. Sometimes you straight up get extra skill points for finding an area. No matter what your build, that's kind of an incentive to poke around a little. There's even a dedicated skill that will highlight some secret switches when you're standing still. Oh my god, I nailed that line. Some secrets you can only get depending on your build. I don't know any other way to get that armor. There are a lot of doors and chests you can't break without a lockpicking skill. This does encourage multiple playthroughs. Whenever I replay it, I always find something new. This wasn't even marked as a secret area. I was stocking up barrels to throw at people, and yeah, there's just a ring in here. Neat. You even get a rope bow that lets you climb up to other areas. That's pretty cool. Ugh. 
You can tackle different sections in your own way. If you're playing a stealth character, you can try pickpocketing keys to get by. Yeah, you gotta grab the physical key. That's an odd cargo they have in these cages. I wonder what would happen if they got loose. Or you could start a goblin revolution instead. It's all up to you. Now this all sounds great, but this game has some problems. As far as gameplay goes, I think the health system has the most issues. You can carry 20 health and mana potions, but there's also a dedicated healing skill you can unlock, or just use a health regen skill. Your health doesn't regenerate naturally, but your magic does, and there's the problem. With the exception of full health potions, health potions and food barely restore your health. And like I said before, you die fast. You can barely get your health bar back on its feet before watching it drop again. Most spells need to be equipped like a weapon to use them, but not the heal skill. You just stand there and press a hotkey, up it goes. You'll run out of healing items fast because enemies can chunk you so hard with each hit, so I ended up using this skill a lot in fights. It didn't cost a lot and it didn't heal a lot either, so it was just kind of this constant need. Even if I had only used potions, the same thing would happen of me constantly needing to heal. This might sound like an odd complaint. There are some brutal levels, and as I showed before, you can't block reliably. I do prefer a health kit system over regenerating health, but I think they need to make them a little bit stronger. It might have been better if you could equip the heal spell like the other spells, have it cost more but also restore more, have potions restore 25 points instead of 10. This might not be a problem for stealth characters, or maybe I sound bad at games. It might be easier to understand when you've played it. I just found it kind of tedious. Without spoilers, the endings are disappointing, but there's some neat stuff in the story. There's also gameplay stuff to talk about, but that would give some stuff away too. If you don't want any spoilers, go to here. Let's talk about women. It's revealed that Xana, the spirit put inside your head earlier, is actually a succubus. Xana spends the entire game flirting with Seraph. This is a nice, quiet place. Oh, too bad we have other things to do. I get that some of you are already opening up the store page, but stay with me. There's also a wizard girl named Liana who's infatuated with the player. She's more of your FCA mission trips to Africa type. Deciding on who you end up with is one of the biggest decisions in the game. It's also one of the only decisions, and as I said before, the story's pretty generic overall. The villain is a necromancer named Arantir. He's rumored to be the Dark Messiah who will unleash the demons into the real world. Like a lot of villains, he really enjoys tormenting you through nightmare visions. But it's revealed around the midway point of the game that you're the demon messiah. That's because the demon sovereign is your father. Ultimate evil being your father isn't new, but they did it in a really sloppy way. There's not even a mention of your dad until about an hour before. My father. I've never met him. Why is he so important? This isn't a very compelling setup for a twist, but after learning this, you can transform into a demon. You constantly lose health, but can regain it by killing enemies, and you move like Satan the Hedgehog. The demon form gets written off, but the extra movement and the charge attack are really useful. But besides that, there's not much else. There's no demon skill tree or anything extra like that, so it seems like wasted potential. But you don't have to keep your demon power. At a later point in the story, Leanna gets kidnapped and sacrificed to Pennywise. Saving her is completely optional. If you go through with it and save her, she tells you how to get rid of your succubus problem. You can be cleansed of Xana in a church, however you won't be able to use your demon form anymore. But then you get to use holy weapons, which are the most powerful in the game. These weapons make the endgame really easy. It is kind of clever that the weapons were cursed to you and you couldn't use them until now. Ah, it burns! It's accursed, I tell you! It's woven with spells for the death of our kind! You could always not save Liana, or save her and not get cleansed, but then she'll want to fight you. You don't get holy weapons, but you do get the better girl. Oh yes, my prince. We will be together. Forever. I'm not seeing any red flags here. You only have two options at the very end, and each one only has a slight variation depending on which girl you pick. So your demon father betrays you, right? Come to me, my son and savior. Well no, you get to rebuild a relationship with your dad. That's nice to see. There's also some pretty fun multiplayer besides the single player, but it's completely dead. There are some Russian servers you can direct join, but those were all empty whenever I looked. Even with mages being overpowered, it was fun. It's kind of a shame, really. It has a fairly deep class system within match unlocks. I like those kinds of games. Despite its jankiness and issues, the single player alone is well worth your time. It's one of my favorite sword fighting games, and it could be yours too. I seem to be surrounded by women who want things from me. Thanks for watching. We're gonna have a stomping good time in October. Oh, he's strong.